Everyone, good morning. Thank you for allowing me to fill your pulpit here once again. It's, it's a privilege to be able to come up, spread the gospel, and uh, pastors that fill the pulpit are like, you know, I can say and do and step on toes because I'm going home after this. You know, I'm not going to come in here tomorrow and see everybody and they're going to be like, hey, you know, what was you saying there the other day? You know, yesterday. So uh, I don't take this lightly and it is really a privilege to come. Um, Laura, or Lisa was talking about the 198 million. It just seems like it wasn't long ago I told in Sunday school, I thought it was just over 100 million. It has doubled you know, and I, I just remember when they started, it was a wonderful, wonderful outreach and evangelism and for, for kids, because a lot of times kids are forgotten in these countries. And the love of Samaritan's Purse allows them to be, each one has their own little box. And that is special because they have something that's theirs, not something that is shared. So, you know, take the boxes, and I'm planning already, I got two granddaughters, I'm going to take one and fill one up, and I'm going to take another one and fill the other one up, and they'll just love it, because they're picking out things for others. They know the, the process. We've taken them before. And finally, um, I saw Mark's beautiful shirt, the, the Steeler shirt. Somewhere around here, I don't, I don't see him now. I saw Troy Palomalu running around. I know it was him. I mean, he's smaller than he was on screen, you know, on, oh, he's hiding back there. Stand up, Troy. Can we, can we get a visual of one of the best players ever to play the game? <laughs> Welcome, Troy. Thank you for coming. Oh, um, the game starts at 1 o'clock. Ooh, all right. I'll see if I can have you out of here by then. Imitation gods. Oh, speaking of things that are worshipped by different people, and it's really hard to describe, like what is going to be worshipped by people? I have a friend that I brought that to my granddaughters and, and others uh, is basically they're worshiping him. And I was telling him about this place and he wanted to see it. So I brought him. Here he is, folks. The grandkids love him. I got him when we were up doing work for WVU Medicine. They wanted to fill the Coliseum because it was kind of odd that it was their 50-year anniversary and nobody was allowed in. So they took our pictures and they made these, and when we were done, we got to take them home. Now, my wife's first idea was, let's take him to the shooting range that we go to. And, and I was on the verge of like, okay, well, and then the grandkids kicked in. They took him, they love him, they take him around. He sits with their tea parties, and, and all, he's out on the porch and the deck playing with him. He's even made it out into the yard. They brought him in, and they said, well, we need a tie. Pap, pap, we need a tie for him. So I showed them my ties, and they picked out the veggie tails. Bob the tomato, Larry the cucumber, and my boy here. Doesn't say much. You know, doesn't really need a drink. You need anything? Any? No? Okay. Pretty self-sufficient he is. But boy, the kids, they were up our house last night, and he, again, was, they wanted to get him to build uh, Tinker Toys, but he just wasn't having it. So, imitation gods. Isn't it funny? Isn't it odd what we look at as something to be worshipped. And uh, there is one God. There is our Lord God Jehovah, Elohim, El Shaddai, that is in heaven. That is who we should worship. All these other things, past and present, are imitation gods. And you notice even a little G 
is beside them. Let's look at some of these other gods that were supposedly so big, you know, in the Old Testament. Because in Exodus, right off the bat, you shall have no other gods before me. You'll not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not have other gods before me. Jesus or God says to them, I'm a jealous God. But what happened? Some of the main gods from back then, probably one of the, I, I picked out a, a few here. The first one would have to be Baal, B-A-A-L. Sometimes they would pronounce or they'd spell it B-A-E-L. And it meant like, you know, how many gods were there? It's the same one. No matter how you spell it, it was Baal, the supreme god of the Canaanites. Uh, and it's really funny how many of these gods were fertility gods. And that allowed the people worshiping them to, well, let's just say, have a chance to go and be fertile. You know, that's why their, their, their image, their take was so strong, was because it allowed people to do the things that they wanted in as much as they wanted and still say, you know, I I'm doing this, I'm doing this for Baal up here. Well, Baal was an imitation god. Uh, the Hebrew name uh, for Baal is owner or master. This is what a, how powerful the, 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 the gods were that controlled and these people worshiped and built things to, gave their lives to. And here's another one, Molech, M-O-L-E-K, Molech. Uh, you'll see pronounced or you'll see spelled M-O-L-O-C-H. Same God, same thing. Uh, this guy, though, was really one of the bad ones because Molech was a child a sacrifice god. He was a major Canaanite deity. His name is a combination of two Hebrew words. One of the words is king, and the other word is shame. Molech, king of shame. And Molech wanted um, baby sacrifices. We were in Israel once, and we were, and we only went like one time, the first time we were there that we ventured down. But you stand up on this like little ridge area and you look down into the, in, like a, a little culvert, a little like bottomland type thing. And there's this thing in there that looks like a huge birthday cake. It's round, it's about four feet high, it's maybe 10, 12 feet wide. And they say, well, go on down. This was one of the monuments, one of the altars that they did to Moloch and some of the other gods. And as you went down and you looked and you started walking around, you saw that the, the altar was made out of skulls of the babies that they sacrificed. And I thought, okay, I'm done. I, I'm, you know, and other people were like, let's go down like we were. Let's go down and see. And they came back up. They were like, oh, my gosh. Did you see that? Did you know what? And I'm like, yeah, we knew what was there. Yeah, we didn't need to go. Um, Moloch, uh, a lot of the Jericho walls that came tumbling down, they found many baby skulls in the walls of Jericho. The Assyrians were also a part of getting this, uh, you know, getting these baby skulls. And, and you know, it, it just, as low as you can get, sacrificing kids, sacrificing babies. So these gods here, um, these, these men were really imitation, no good, gods that we see now. Um, then finally, the last one is a lady. It is Asherah. She is one of the goddesses of the Old Testament Canaanite. She is given the name the mother of all gods, the mother of the gods, the great goddess. Yeah. Well, you would have her honored 
by they would build what was called these poles, these Asherah poles. They would build them. They looked like big totem poles. And they would put them up on the high places. And then people would go up there to worship Asherah. 1 Kings 14.23, it says, For they built on high places pillars and poles to the goddess Asherah. And one of the things that were, was done immediately when the, uh, the Israelis went in was to go and find those high places because they liked to worship on the high places as well. So these people that had these gods wanted to mock them in a sense where they would go up and they would put their deities up on the high places. And, and there are a number of, of references in the, in the Old Testament to the Asherah poles. Um, you know, again, false God, imitation God. Um, I looked in the, did some studying. There's numbers you can have, lots of names and all, but many of the names were just the same God or goddess, um, and and they, but they were different whenever the Assyrians or the Canaanites or the Jebusites or the Amalekites, whoever, they would talk about who they were. There were probably, a good guess was there were about 35 gods in the Old Testament. And imitation gods, every one, no good, but the people just they just didn't know. They, and, and the Israelis tried to go in. This is why when they took the land, when they crossed the Jordan River and Joshua gave to the people uh, their land, he said, you must destroy these people over here and wipe out their gods because if you don't, he knew that they would have some influence on the Israeli people. And ultimately they did. You know, the, the, if they didn't go and wipe out people, if they left a small faction of people that were in the land there that should have been killed but weren't, eventually they overcame the, the people that were in their area. So it was important that these imitation gods get wiped out. And, and to a large degree, they did. Okay, how about now? What are we looking at? This was the Old Testament. Let's talk about today. What imitation gods are out there rearing their ugly heads in our neck of the woods? Not this guy. He's my buddy. I'm going to take him home and the, and the grandkids will see him. I might even take him to the soccer game today because they're going to be playing. It'll be great that they look over on the side of there when they're playing soccer and they see my boy here. What about today? Wow, I looked and did some research talking about what are our gods of today? What is it that we worship in our society right now? And as I was reading them, I thought, oh, sure, absolutely. Look at the commercials. Look at what's out there. Look at what they're peddling out there on the TV. And look in your magazines. Look on your billboards and everything. What is being peddled? Number, there, there's a few of them here. I'm going to start with like number four or so. Beauty. Beauty is a, a God that, that a lot of people worship, an imitation God. We admire people who are attractive. That's, you know, and it's all style, but no substance for the most part. But yet, we admire magazine gods. We are a very vain society. And when we see someone up there that is pretty and slim and rich, well, we want to maybe admire them. And, and even further on, you say, you know what? I want to be like that. That is what the salespeople, their first job in selling you something is to make you think that what you have isn't good enough and that you have to get something else. Your car is not good enough. Your washing machine is not the, the same. Look at that garage. You need to get a new garage. They want to make you think that what you have is not adequate. It's not attractive or beautiful. 
So maybe you want to consider getting something else, getting something better. Number four, number three maybe on the list, number four. Oh, before we leave beauty, look at Proverbs 31.30. Flat out says it, beauty is fleeting, absolutely. Uh, Beauty is here today, gone tomorrow, and what we put into it is here today and gone tomorrow, and we're left uh, broken. Oh, my gosh. How about substances? That's a really good imitation, God, that we have today more than ever. We have substances. We inject into our bodies all kinds of things to make us what? They maybe make us forget of our hurts. They make us uh, numb from the pain. Or maybe you can inject something into your life that maybe will spice up your life. You know, and, and, and people absolutely love these imitation gods that are called substances. Nicotine, caffeine any of this stuff. We are a country that has, a lot of times we go by the philosophy, better living through chemistry. Sometimes it's really good. We need certain drugs. We need certain substances if we are going to live. Many people would be in trouble if they did not have these things. And, and, you know, those are the good things about substances. But, boy, you look now, especially now, when you talk about, uh, you know, coming the fentanyl coming across the border. Last year in America, uh, in the 2021, over 107,000 people uh, between, like, uh, 18 and 39. The prime people in our community. I'm not mismeaning to diss on, you know, us older people or anything, but these are the people that are ready to step in and be the leaders, be the future. 107,000 of them, that's like 300 a day, died from fentanyl poisoning or overdose. And, And that's not even counting. You know, that's just that drug. Oh, by the way, I heard the other day that we are already, here it is, September, we already have surpassed last year in fentanyl poisoning. So it's growing. People are falling victim to this imitation God that they fall down to and want to be like and get, and it ends up, well, they are sacrificing their life to this imitation God because it's killing them. Heroin, crack cocaine, you know, all these. Uh, there's so many things that are out there that are separate. Fentanyl is the big one. And, and it's taking more and more people. Uh, there was a lady, there was a young girl. I was doing a funeral for her mom years ago. And we knew their family really well. And they lived in, in Waynesburg. And uh, the mom passed away. And the, the, the dad was there and his son and one of the daughters. Well, the other daughter had run away and they didn't know what was going on. She was with the bands and she was going around and doing all kinds of things. Well, they heard from the rehab place that she was admitted as a heroin addict. Well, they let her out to go to her mom's funeral. And I was sitting and visiting with her, her and her counselor, and I said, you know, you grew up with all these kids around here. You were at my house as much as you were at your, your own house. And what happened? And she says, well, when I got out of the houses, things started to happen. I said, well, how is your life now? How is a life that has been an imitation god of, of heroin? What's it like? She said, every morning I wake up, I think to myself, how can I get $40? What do I need to do today to get $40? Because that's what a heroin hit costs. So she said, my goal, my life's ambition, whenever I would get up in the morning, was to think, okay, how can I get 40 bucks? 
She was so addicted. Rehab and all was helping her. She was like in and out. But an imitation God, just like beauty and, and, and you know, it has a pull on people. And they follow that pull. And, and they follow it to a fault. Imitation gods do that to people. They lead you down a terrible path, and eventually when they're done with you or you're done with them, uh, let's just hope that you're still breathing, because a lot of times maybe you're not. Another, oh, this is going to be a good one. Another imitation God that people follow. Religion. Religion. And you're like, okay, wait, what the heck? Religion? You're kidding me. Not this religion. Not a God-centered, wonderful, uh, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit-filled church such as this. There are religions out there, and you know them. There are, they show up on your porch every now and then, different groups. You read about them in the paper, blowing up innocent people, and it was for their religion. You know, their religion has a god, and they would name their gods, but they're imitation gods. Religion and God are not the same thing. Religion without God simply is an empty shell. Religion is, a lot of people have religion, but they don't have God. That is the true God. Our God in heaven, our Lord Jesus and God, the Holy Spirit that is here now waiting to come into people's hearts, they want to just be invited. Jesus came and he taught with the word. He taught with, with miracles that he did. A lot of the religions that are out there now want you to be a part of their religion and they're willing to do violence to get you to be part of their religion. A big thing, a big difference between our religion that we have right now in Jesus Christ and like let's say the, the group that, that uh, follows the, the sun god Allah, the, our their God says to them, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring glory to me. I want you to live so that you bring glory to me. I want you to go out and do whatever, all these things that a radical bunch of them do. And I want you to go out and I want you to begin to do these terrible things. And if you die in the process, you dying will bring glory to me. And boy, there is no shortage of people that want to go out and do for Allah. Now, what, how, what's our religion? How's our religion different from that? We have a religion where Jesus Christ came down and said, I will die for you. I will take your place. Now, there may be martyrs, certainly, that go out and want to do Jesus Christ's work but he is not sending them out like the God Allah and saying, go and do, and if you get killed, oh well, that's just the cost of doing business. We have a God that will die for us and has died for us and has paid the price and gone before us into heaven to prepare a place for us so that when our great waking up morning comes and our day of reckoning is here, we will follow him and we will be with him. And we won't have to, to go out and do and martyr ourselves and kill innocent people to show him how much we love him. Big difference. You can have religion, but it means nothing if you don't have God. There are a lot of other things out there. Matthew, Matthew 6, 24. No one can serve two masters. You want to serve God? Serve God. You want to serve beauty or substances? You want to serve religion? That's something else. But you can't serve that and still serve God. It is impossible. I was in SCI. I was a, a, a 
a uh, SCI Green down there. I was a volunteer chaplain. The people that were in there, the inmates were in there, were always trying to come up with new, new religions. And if it was a religion, if it was a bona fide religion, well, then the state correctional institute had to allow them the means to have and celebrate their religion. The, the Muslims had the prayer shahs, Jehovah's Witnesses, the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were in there, the, the Catholics, and then I would go in for the Protestant services. There was one group that, that tried really hard to convince them, and they were looking up all kind of, of details that they said their religion was, and I don't, I don't even remember the name, what they called it. And basically their religion was that they got to go for a couple hours on Sunday and sit in a hot tub and smoke dope. That's a heck of a religion, you know? Yeah, you know, I could see why you would want that. But fortunately, it really wasn't a religion. So what else is out there? What other things, what other imitation things are we following that are imitation? Science. You've heard the Hollywood people with their Scientology stuff. Uh, do we serve uh, one of the imitation gods that's out there? And it is a billion, billion dollar industry of people following them. And that is the sex and pornography industry. Imitation. Pure greed, lust, flesh. But yet, how many people follow that imitation god? Money. Money is another one. Money has a place. We have to have money. We have to have some kind of currency in order to conduct business and do. That's why they talk about whenever the end times are coming that people will be embedded with a chip so that they can conduct business. If you don't have that chip, you're not going to be able to conduct business. If you accept that chip, you're saying, I'm going to follow a false god, an imitation called the Antichrist. If you don't take that chip, very possibly uh, the, during the tribulation, you'll be killed. But you'll be killed in the name of Jesus Christ. You won't be killed because, or you won't be living with a false imitation god that is the Antichrist. Finally, the last God, the last imitation God that we serve here. Boy, you know, I'm, I think I'm just getting in deeper here. I am going to run to my car, and, and I'm going to grab my boxes and, and beat a hasty retreat here. We've already talked about religion being a, an imitation God. This one is really, this one really hits home. Self. Self, number one imitation God that we worship now here in this world, certainly in America. Self. You know what? Uh, nobody's going to look out for me. Uh, you got to look out for number one. Uh, I got my buddy here. I'm looking out for him. So, you know, he knows. He knows he's not alone. But, you know, and, and it all based, all this stuff that people say, me, my, you know, it started in, in chapter 11 in, in the book of Genesis when they said, look what we can do. Let's show God what we can do. We can build a tower all the way up to heaven to show him this is what we can do. And what did he do? Struck them down. Made their languages go from one language to many languages. And, it, and the, the New Testament to that, the New Testament thing is during the day of Pentecost when they spoke one language, but yet everybody heard it in theirs. When it was time for the church to come together, he did opposite of what they did for the Tower of Babel, where one person, Peter spoke, and the apostles spoke one language, but yet it was heard by everybody. When God is ready for his church, for his people to go out and be active, he does stuff like that. And he looks past self. He looks past us. He doesn't care what we think we can do. Love Joshua. Have it at home. We have it a couple of different places. We get little, you know, we've got some stones that I have to keep getting a magic marker and writing on. But Joshua 24, beginning with 14, 
Now fear the Lord and serve Him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the god of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But for me and my household, and you know this very famous, very popular, well-known Bible, as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. He gave them options. Serve the gods of the Amalekites. Serve the gods that were in Egypt when your people, when you were all, a lot of you were down there. Choose for yourself this day, he says. And that still rings true here. Choose for yourself this day, this Sunday, this September 18th. Don't walk out those doors thinking, oh my gosh, you know what? I really don't know how I stand with God. I, I mean, you know, I know who he is and I know a lot about him. Well, Satan knows who he is. Satan knows who, you know, a lot about God. You need to say to yourself, I am going to serve the Lord in heaven, the Lord Jehovah, with my whole, as we read here in, in you know, the greatest commandment, they ask him, he, and Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. He told us earlier in, in Exodus, you shall not have any other gods before me. And then he follows it up in Matthew. Serve and love the Lord your God with all your heart, your might, your mind, your everything that you have within you. Let it all serve the Lord. People that come in and they play the musical instruments, people that sing, they have gifts that God has given them. And they use them here in God's house. That is the best that we can do, is to come in here and sing. And people are like, that was really wonderful. And you hear from them so much, I give the glory to God. I am so glad that he allows me the privilege to come in here and do these things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And love your neighbor as yourself. Have a good positive image. It's, it's hard to go out and witness to somebody about Jesus Christ if you have a bad uh, image of yourself. You know, you need to go before you go and you start witnessing and re recognize how you stand. What is your stance with God? Then you can go and witness to others. What if the gods that we worship here and we've already talked about the, the Baals and the Molachs and the uh, Asherah. You know, we've talked about one of the biggest things that, that we have to fight. Number one, we have to fight one of the things is pride. Pride, one of the first sins when, when Satan got cast out of heaven. I want to be like God. Pride. And then when you say, what are you going to give up for? It's coming up. What are you going to give up for, for the new year? They said, I'll give up this and this and this. I will give up. But the number one thing people will not give up? Control. I will not give up control. I want control of my life. I want control of my family. By golly, when I'm sitting there watching TV, I got the remote right here so that I can pick what's on the screen. Control is a powerful thing. And a lot of people do not want to give up. And when you say to them, surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Ooh, boy, that surrender part. Ah, I'm going to need some explanation on that. Well, if you do, then you stay here and you talk when people are leaving. If you want to talk, I'll be here. Deacons are here. Deacons are here during the week. Deacons are here. Elders are here. You can sit and visit with them and find out. The things that we need to have in our life right now. Generosity. Opposite of self. Imagine if seven billion people on earth were generous. 
open-mindedness. Everybody, to some degree, is judgmental a little. Be willing to change. Stop being so judgmental. Have an open mind on things. How about compassion? Help others first. Less on yourself, more on them. Here's a good one. Patience. Oh, I want patience. Instead of sighing and tapping your foot and wondering what the heck's going on, be content to wait. You know what? Wait. Jesus waited 30 years before he began his ministry. Patience is truly a virtue. And the last one, and I'm done, the last thing that we would really love to have, you want to worship something and you want to be something, how about kindness? What would it be like if people were kind to each other? Well, you talk about grasping at straws, hoping that people are kind is really a stretch. Many people are kind to some degree. We need more. We need more and more and more of those. We need to show that there is kindness. So, we had the invitation gods of back in the Old Testament, and you saw what they led to. We have some of the invitation gods of today, and you see what's happening whenever people worship those invitation gods. But you also see that there are imitation quote, imitation gods out there, like generosity and kindness and faith and joy and forgiveness. That's a big one. Worship those. If you're going to worship imitation gods, worship things like those where you can actually love the Lord and be helping your neighbor. Let's pray. Lord, um, we're, we're babies in what we do. We are uh, feeling our way, searching, looking, and sometimes we fall into the traps. Sometimes the trap door opens with us right on top of it and we fall down into something that we don't know how to get out of. But even from the depths, Lord, you know who we are and you can help us. Anybody here Anybody wanting to hear, Lord, let them find somebody and speak to them. Don't let them be worried about their salvation. And certainly, Lord, don't let them go off chasing false gods. Amen.